Hello, you're welcome to Inside Out with Agatha Anniversary Special. Today we have as our guest somebody who I'm very honored to meet. Please help me welcome to the program His Excellency, the Governor of Lagos State, Mr. Babatunde Raji Fashala, SAN. Sir, you're welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me. A new traffic law came into being. I want to start with that before we... Um, my question would be, why a new traffic law? Well, uh, let me start first by commending the work that you do. I, I must confess, I watch your program. Oh, and, uh, uh, yes, and I see young people there and the way you inspire them. And uh, I, I can only ask you to continue to do what you do well and so effortlessly. Thank you very much, uh, sir. But uh, let me also add that uh, there are not many things in that law that are new. Um, First, what we sought to achieve was that um, we, we sought to put the body of laws and many amendments together in one place. So uh, there have been a lot of amendments to our road traffic law from when I was a child. and So they are in so many places. So if you have the main law, you're probably looking for an amendment. And that doesn't help to arm the citizen okay. with knowledge about what is permissible on Lagos roads. And with, without that knowledge, you can innocently run foul of the law. So you so said without, put it all in one place. Okay. And then, of course, to make proposed changes to respond to certain things that we have observed as emerging conduct that government cannot shut its eyes to. Um, uh, the way people manage vehicles. Uh, in a manner that is inconsistent with accepted practice, the way... When you say that, what do you mean? Driving against okay. the established order, what we call one way. Yeah. And, um, and we, we, we've decided to propose uh, uh, legislation that would deter people from doing so. Now, um, one has had comments like, oh, the law is severe. And my answer is very simple. Yeah. Um, all that the law has done is to eliminate the option of fine. And, and this is important because we have seen a situation where the law has become inefficient in its deterrent objective hmm. because people can simply pay a fine yeah. and go away. But by the time you pay, fine. In all probability, you have endangered other people's lives. Okay, that's true. Now, a fine doesn't bring back a lost life. True. Now, so we thought, no. And contrary to the feeling out there, we don't intend to put people in jail. We would rather people comply. And I tell everybody who cares to listen, the law is an idle piece of paper. It won't jump on you in your car. It won't come and meet you in your house. It is your behavior that will, that will trigger it. So yeah. if, unless you have a preset notion that you're going you are to going break, to break, the, break, break the, law, the law, you have nothing to worry about. Sure. Even if you were accused of actually breaching that law, you have a constitutional presumption of innocence in your favor. Nobody can punish you without trial. You would have the right to a, to a lawyer of your choice. So, and you would have, if you were dissatisfied with any decision, you would have the right to, to challenge it on appeal. Sir, I want to ask you a question. Let me say in Lagos State, as far as Lagos State is concerned, we would even say LASMA probably does a better job when it comes to persecution, even though um, um, they have also been accused of being prone to <coughs> bribes and all of yeah. that. But is it, if, if we're looking at, because like you have rightly mentioned, a lot of these laws already exist. Enforcement seems to be the problem. Yeah. And when you talk about um, flouting rules, it usually seems to be, I mean, with the recent arrest you have made mm. of even people in uniform, mm. which, you know, I was so glad and proud and say, you know, thank God somebody can stand up to these people. When you see a bus driver going against one way, he has a policeman sitting in front. Mm. That's the only time he has the effort to, to even try something like that. Mm. Now, with the caliber of people who usually flout this road, laws, who is going to be enforced? Now, you bring so many things to the table at once. For me, it's, it's a matter of very deep regret and high concern that those who wear uniforms in law enforcement agencies, LASMA, CAI, police, the Nigerian military, 
the few of them, and they are in the minority. They are? They are in the minority. Who, who use their uniform, the authority of the state, to breach the laws of the state, do this nation a great disservice. I, I want to make that point very clear. But having said that, um, apprehension will still depend on LASMA. It will depend also on uh, the police. It will also depend on you and I. Use your camera. We've prosecuted members of our own workforce. I saw, for example, uh, I think it was a year ago, a reporter in Punch took a photograph of one of our drivers, the refuse compactor trucks, driving on the BRT. But because all of the numbers are broadly emblazoned on the truck, we found out who was driving the car. I was just reading the papers and I saw it and I said, I want to know who drove this on the BRT lane. And he's out of our system. We've dismissed him. And then we've charged him to court. And in those instances, I but insist that... But these are instances that, where you have actually been brought into the yes, picture. Yes, but there are other instances where people have been arrested. There are last man men there, there are police officers there, who also are not happy about the way all of us have behaved. And nobody, nobody should, be, uh, should be exonerated here. The military officer, the police officer, the last man officer are metaphors of who we have become. They are just the ones who are unfortunate to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. How many of us sincerely can own up and say, I have not bought a toothpick in traffic? I haven't bought a comb. It adds up to what we shouldn't do. It adds up to the difficulty we all aggregate by our own conduct. Every time you slow down to buy chewing gum, you pack up the traffic. And then when we complain, the traffic is bad. But the point I wanted to make, now, if arrests are made, charges are laid, the Ministry of Justice is going to lead the prosecution. And we are also going to be working with teams of law firms that we have shortlisted, who have criminal prosecution and experience, so that we are not persecuting people. And they will dispassionately be able to say, no, on this evidence, we are not going to court. Get this, get this out of the way. But more importantly is that last year, I signed into law a new criminal code law for Lagos State that repealed the old criminal code law of the state, which had been in force for almost uh, 100 years. <laughs> now, some of the things that that law is remembered for were those provisions that says that you cannot abandon a pregnant woman and all of that. It's remembered for that. If you put a young woman in the family where you must well, pay yeah. maintain. It's remembered for that. Yeah. What, what people don't remember it for is that that is the law that makes very clear provisions now for non-custodial sentence in Lagos State. And by that I mean you can now sentence people for very serious offenses without them going to prison. So you can sentence them to community service. Oh, we have introduced oh, that. Oh, yes. So this is what we expect to see more of. And those who are worried, about, I think that I will get more compliance if we see, if I arrest an Agatha, for example, and I put her at the junction of, uh, of, uh, of a whole lot of way, in uniform, <laughs> serving community service for <laughs> breaching traffic rules. And we put you there every day for 30 days. And when you finish there, we send you to a driver's institute for a period to be determined by the magistrate if you are found guilty. If. So you're saying that is an option? Oh, yeah, it, will, it will be the first term. option. The jail term is the most extreme. Oh, I don't think that is reflected in yes, the way pe it was pe pe reported. Yes, people have jumped at things. That is why I'm glad at this opportunity. When a law says that you are guilty, if you are guilty of an offense, you will pay 1,000 naira. That is the maximum that oh, the okay. judge we can impose. Get, we don't get that. So the jail time is actually the maximum. There will be lesser punishments. Hmm. All we have removed is that you won't just pay fine and go away. You must do something. You must do something you you must serve that will something. make you think twice okay. about doing that thing again. Hmm. You can't buy your way out of criminality. That's what we want to. That's the point we want to make. Oh, that's good. Thank you very much, sir, for the clarification. Um, I want to talk about the BRT service. I noticed that a lot of the buses are getting old. Oh yeah. 
Um, I don't know whether it is our maintenance culture, just the way we are as Nigerians or as human beings and why things don't seem to last. But it, um, is there any, are there any plans to like rejuvenate or change or how does it work? Um, first of all, in all those other jurisdictions where you see successful bus systems, uh, quite a number of them, I know of Brazil, I know of the United Kingdom, I know of the United States, they all produce their vehicles. So it's not that the vehicles don't get damaged. The turnaround time for repair and replacement is quicker. Here, we have to order those buses. And they are subject, of course, to the vicissitude of our ports and the time it takes to get them in and out of the ports. That's one. Two, uh, the owners of the buses the unions. Especially the blue ones. Yes. That, that, Those have been the, really bad. The owners state. of the buses, the, the, new, the unions, they have bought new buses. I think that they're trying to get them out. I don't know what's... I, I can't say... But I know they've, they've bought new buses. Those are the first batch of buses that they started with about four years ago. Yeah. So wear and tear really on a daily basis is about time really to decommission those buses. But even before they're decommissioned, they can all go back into a maintenance yard and quite a number of them can still be refitted. And that's why even in the UK you see new buses and sometimes you see relief from some old buses. We have a maintenance yard at Oshodi, the old Kappa bus stop. But we have acquired a bigger one uh, further down at uh, near PWD off, off the main road that we need to really rebuild. It's a six hectare site for total repair refurbishment and all of that. And of course, um, even washing the buses, we have had to improvise. Now, okay, because there's, there's like no big yeah, we have, we have to do it by hand. Now, we've acquired a car wash system that washes about, I think, 10 buses every 20 minutes or so. You just yeah. drive through. We've installed it, but it has, We've had difficulties with the quality of pipes that were available for the water to pass. So we literally had to import new pipes, and that's why it's not yet up and running. But it's been installed. We haven't fully completed the commissioning process. So um, we were responding to an emergency at the time, daily traffic, busing system. But immediately you solve one problem in the public sector, you move on to another one because it creates a new problem. But Again, every problem creates also an opportunity. Um, at the third million bridge, with the work going on, one of the provisions that we thought would be made would be the increase in the people would demand more for the ferry service. Mm. Um, has this worked? What, Let me, how, did, how were you able to manage that situation? Because a lot of people use third million. I think that we have inflicted on ourselves more emotional pain than we needed to. And uh, I will say this because four years ago, or thereabout, we worked on the third Milan Bridge. There were 12 expansion joints that were faulty. Because it was the responsibility of the federal government, they said they could do only four. So we did the same diversion that we are doing there today, four years that ago. That is true. I think I remember that. Yeah. I remember because yes, I, I led the operations. That. Now, we did the same diversion there. At the time we were doing that diversion, we were constructing Mutala Mohammed Way in Yaba. It was under construction. We were constructing Funshaw Williams. Yes. Oshodi was a no-go, so you couldn't use Agege Motor Road. And the noise was not this high. So what happened? So I, and I think that we've just allowed the media to say, oh, terror is coming, Chod Milambri is going to be shut down without really ex uh, going through all the options that are available. Now you have Mutala Mohammed Way open through, right through to Ido, so you cross to the island. Yes. You have Funshaw Williams is open. Yes. Agege Motor Road is now passable. Yes. You now have traffic radio, which you didn't have before. Oh, yes. To give you advance warning, we are stronger and better today than we were four oh, years yes. ago. And, and we are not doing anything different than what we did four years ago. So it's just for people to sit down and plan their journeys. And as I said then, if you don't have to be on the road, stay off the road. There's rush hour in every city. That is true. So if, if you, you get in traffic the UK, in the morning during rush from hour. 7 o'clock to 10 o'clock, it's rush hour. So if you don't have to be on the road at that time, don't stay at home. 
let those who are going to work, the students who are going to school, if you have a medical appointment, you have a telephone now, you can ask your doctor to reschedule you for 11. If you have something you can postpone, postpone it. But from 11 a.m. till around 2 p.m., it's light traffic. Yes. And from 3 p.m., the rush hour reverses. I know how many cars are in my convoy, ambulance, towing vehicles that we carry because sometimes people break down and we help them out of traffic. So I always ask myself, should I put 10 cars on the road? Sometimes I move meetings to my house, depending on which way traffic is going. So sometimes I want to meet people who are coming from Victoria Island. Why take them all the way to Alaus? I stay in, I stay in Ikoi. And I do my business there. So people have to understand that the road is an asset. It has to be shared. We can't all be on it at the same time. It won't serve our purpose. And there's a time of the day when that road is not used. So I want to talk about the proposed rail network. I actually had to drive um, to, um, what's that area called? Eric Moore? Eric Moore. Eric Moore. Really? Really? I was amazed. How long is it going to take for this to start working fully? Before I answer that question, let me go back very quickly to the issue of ferry service yes. because they are all interlinked. And what we seek to do really is to link the ferry to the rail yeah, you said so. and to the bus. You did say so during the... Um, so we are doing three major ferry terminals, major, but we've constructed not less than 15 smaller ferry terminals across the River Rhine area of Lagos from Lekki all the way to Ojo. And there's a thriving ferry service there on the waterways on the lagoon today. The ridership has gone up from a few hundred thousand to over three million passengers every month. But our work is not finished. When we are finished, we will open it up. But the triangle of the ferry service is Ikorodu, Osborne, and Badore in Aja. Badore is ready, Ikorodu is ready, Osborne is going to start roofing. Do we have those um, kind of barges where you can actually just drive in and then get to the other side? And we have one already in Lagos that will take 25 there. vehicles. Really? We are coupling the second one that will take another 25 vehicles because uh, I've been under pressure to operate the first one. I say it didn't make sense to send only one into the water because the expectation will be high. One has to go all the way and come back. Now they're coupling the second one, and once that's ready, you can drive your car onto it and Whilst one is going across, the other one is coming, okay. so you can see each other. But quickly back to the rail. The only mitigating thing in terms of delivery now for the rail is money. So we're trying to raise money because we've done it out of every little cobble, every little tax and all of that, that we can get raising bonds, borrowing money. And so we can only run as quickly as our revenues. So from rail, we're doing ferry, we're doing jetties, we're building hospitals, we're building roads, we are resurfacing roads, we are providing water. So, so many things fighting for the same pot, pot of money. I wish we could dedicate one year's budget solely to that real facility. Then I could tell you that working 24 hours a day, because as a Chinese that we are using the work seven, hours, seven days a week, there is, no, there is no Sunday for them. They are there Sundays and Saturdays. Then we'll be able, But what is important is that we will deliver it in phases. And when the first phase is ready, you will see the trains starting to run. And that is where rail tracks are built in modules. When the next phase is ready, you inch it on. So is there any um, perspective date for the we're, first we're, phase? We're looking at 2014 now. Let's take a break. We'll be right back. <music> Sir, um, you have been very um, concerned with um, renewing infrastructure since... Um, your administration started. How far have you gone to achieving your goal when it comes to um, renewal of infrastructure? Well, uh, it's, we still have a deficit, undoubtedly. Um, the whole nation is living on infrastructure that is about 40 years old. Especially the roads. The roads. And um, is to ask how many new roads have we added against the population that we have added, against the vehicles that we have added. So most of the roads that are sustaining the country were built in the early 70s, early 80s. So, and the population of Lagos State in the 70s and 80s was barely 5 million people. So you can see the deficit. So 
the decision to address infrastructure was deliberate. That if you didn't breach that deficit, this place would have been much more difficult to live in. And, and we saw poverty globally, and therefore nationally and locally. And we thought to ourselves, what can we do? What was the biggest blow that we could strike in our quest to eradicate poverty? And we said, if we reduce the deficit of infrastructure by spending more money on infrastructure, we were convinced economically that this was the way to do it. First, it would make life easier to live. It would make business easier to do. It would make transportation much more efficient. But in addition to that, by government spending on infrastructure, you are waking up the economy. People would have jobs, construction companies, engineering companies, consulting engineers, architects. Everybody would be busy simply by government spending. They will employ people. Suppliers and distributors of iron rod, cement, sand, food at construction sites, you were waking up the economy. Yeah, true. Now, I know two construction companies. In the last four years, one of them, by the number of jobs that we commissioned in Lagos, employed 15,000 people. The Chinese company that is constructing the rail has employed 4,000 people. It still has a potential to take more, another 3,000, just for that project. So you see, therefore, that it is focusing on an economic plan that will create jobs. Not just mentioning jobs, I want to create jobs. What is the plan? Now, for the foreseeable future, infrastructure is still the linchpin to wake up this economy. So if you don't spend, you will lose. Because of where we are, because of the fast growth rate of our population, because of the deficit that we have, foreseeably, if all of the states continue to invest in infrastructure and the federal government continues to invest in infrastructure, we can't go wrong in this country. It's the quickest way to wake up the economy. Beyond infrastructure now, the medium term that we are looking at and the long-term sustainers of this economy for us will be tourism and information technology. So, we see the future 70 years from now. That's what I'm looking at. Sir, but even talking about tourism, it still comes back to power now. As, even as, a, as somebody who lives in Lagos, I usually would prefer at a, after a particular time to only go on Ikorudu Road. Simple reason, it, it's lit. We have all finished. I would finished. go on Oshodi. Simple reason, I can find my way around. I wouldn't go on Third Mainland Range, what is this, nine? because mm. it is dark yeah. now as a tourist and i'm coming into town we've been trying to take over that responsibility from the federal government and light it up because it's easy to do really but we've just been having these unresolved issues we will soon finish ikorodu road from uh, uh, jibo to my 12. it will all be lit up before the end of the year so as lagos is a major commercial hub and um, i understand now i did speak to the nrc uh, chairman dg um, he said that um, we're now allowed to generate our own power and he used Lagos State as an example where he talks about the eco distribution company and let me ask for for you as the governor of Lagos State knowing how urban and commercial and how much it would expand business do you have any plans to ensure that we light up Lagos for our six first of all <clears throat> yes but for our six let me say that I, I sincerely and honestly wish that the national power reform project succeeds because that is what will really help and uh, the idea for example of generating your own power or distributing your own power for example is something that i would like to have amended and i've made that clear to the dg neck and some of the big players in in the sector but that's that's one thing um, we have a plan and that is why we now have a Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources in Lagos. Mm. And that ministry's responsibility is to take responsibility for powering Lagos, making Lagos energy sustainable, developing the energy policy for Lagos, consistent with the national energy policy and global energy policy about renewable energy and all of those things. Yeah. Now, we've revived the old electricity board most of the lights that you see at night 
today on our, on our streets are being maintained by that board. It has a core of young people, engineers, fresh from school now, who do that work. They are also doing street light installation because we can still control many of the street lights, power them with diesel and generators. The ones on the island are being powered from the IPP that we built on the Lagos island. So we are increasing the distribution network. That's why you see most of the island is, is much more lit up at night because the source is now being centralized. Mm. And we hope to start the same thing in Ikeja. There's a new IPP coming up just behind here that will take up the whole of the government secretariat from PHCN. And there's one we are designing for uh, Ikeja GRA that would power our general hospital, mm. the area command, the high courts, the magistrate courts, the state police command, and the police college, and all the public institutions there. What we target with our power projects in places where we can do them, because you are not allowed to distribute. That's the problem with it. Oh, you're thing. not? That's you're what not. we're told. I will come back to it. You're not allowed to distribute. You can only have ring fence power. Now, I will come back to it and explain why. Okay. Is, so we can target government institutions and take them off. In that way, we relieve the power demand on the distribution companies, and they can give it to the citizens. Just like the Lagos Power Project has taken off the General Hospital Island Maternity, the so High the Court, the Magistrate the Court, the State House, they've been off PACN since August last year. Hmm. So now, what the Constitution provides currently is that you can distribute only in places where there is no national grid. Those places haven't been designated. So, Agatha has responsibility for broadcasting but in he, Lagos. But, he hasn't told me but where. I can broadcast in places where Agatha is not, not broadcasting. broadcasting. Where is she not broadcasting? Mm, okay. That's an issue that I think should be resolved. But I must say this for the record. NEC has shown readiness to engage and to encourage, and we are knocking at the door. We're looking at taking a place like Lekki off the grid if they agree, because we can power it, because we are developing a power solution for Lekki, because we want to power our water supply in Lekki and our water supply in Victoria Island. And we think that it is easy. Lekki is more or less... Uh, but isn't that what the privatization is supposed to be about? Yes, Lagos but Lekki is already under the distribution catchment of a co-distribution company. Eco, doesn't a co-distribution company belong to Lagos State? No. It doesn't? It doesn't. <laughs> What? Oh, that is... Now, let me, let me quickly make that point. PHCN was one company doing generation, transmission, and distribution. Yes. By the power reform sector law, it was broken into 17 companies, or 18 companies, 18 companies, uh, six generation companies, 11 distribution companies, one transmission company. The transmission company is the one that Manitoba has just signed a management agreement with. Yes. Now, the generation companies are those that will generate the power. The distribution companies, two of them in Lagos, Eco and Ikeja, yeah. are one, so they don't belong to us. Okay, so now you're, but you're allowed to ask for your own license even as... Now, that's another interesting thing because they haven't created, that was one thing that I recommended because all of the companies that you now have are all traceable to the old PHCN. Yes. Okay? And I said that, yes, this is fine, but why don't you create some greenfield companies that have nothing, nothing. to do that with would PHCN? Make sense. They don't have any staff. They don't have any assets. They are not carrying any backlog. Create PHCN. one or two like that so that they can compete with the behemoth. That's my own thinking. Now that's that why I said, if, if the responsibility were mine, those are some of the things I would do differently. Different. So at the flood, Lagos State has always had this peculiar flooding problem. You know, you, 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 you seem to try to prepare people for it, yet they, they, they don't seem to be ready when it comes. Luckily this year, we haven't had it as bad as it was last year. Mm. I don't think so, at least. Mm. The canals have been, they, they are cleared and then they fill up again and then they are cleared again. But how has it been for you? I, I, I say that uh, the rains mean 
so many things to different people. For some people, it's extra sleep. <laughs> uh, for me, it used to be extra sleep before I came into government. Uh, but once there's severe rainfall now, I must wake up yes. and wake people up. 3 a.m., 4 a.m., sometimes 6 a.m., just to see. Can and I ask when you sleep? <laughs> if you sleep? I often go to sleep at around 3 o'clock. Every day? Yeah. So, but that's what it means to me now, because it's to check the systems that we've put in place, whether it's working, so that people's homes don't get flooded, the streets don't get flooded, people get about their lives. But um, let me say to the credit of the people of Lagos, they have responded uh, significantly, but there's always room to improve on what we have done. Um, we must prepare for every season because every season brings its own hazards. And in the same way that the, when it's end of summer, the Europeans begin to prepare their clothing. They change their clothing. Mm. They begin to buy warm clothing getting ready for winter. So why should we be different? Really and truly. And when it's getting to summer, they take off the warm clothing and take on lighter clothing. Okay. And as they prepare for winter, they are stocking salt, grit salt, yeah. to fight snow. They are fixing their snow carts. And sometimes the whole thing doesn't work, and you are snowed in. And there's nothing you can do about it. So in the same way, we know that it's going to rain. We are living in the coast. We are below sea level. Why should we wait for it to catch us by surprise? If we don't want flood, then let us leave the coast and go to higher ground. Each region brings its own benefits and its challenges. So, Lagosians have responded, and as you point out, it's not as severe as it was last year because they are beginning to adapt to the realities that look. So all that education. It will flood, it's paying off. People are taking ownership now. We are designing modules now that will help people understand that what they consider as drains, or what we normally know as drains, the gutters mm. by the roadside, are mere channels. The real drains are the lagoons and the creeks and the rivers. So every canal that is close to your house is actually your drain. Mm. And we want to produce models that will help everybody in Lagos identify which canal drains his street, and his local government, and then take ownership of it. So that if you go and throw refuse there, I will challenge you. Because you're endangering me, you're endangering my children, you're endangering my property. And once we do that, I think people will come to a better understanding. And that's what part of what took us to Makoko, because the old line where people had settled and we said, okay, we, we, we see you here, is expanding. And in that way, they're diminishing the size and the width of the lagoon. And that is the lagoon that drains Onike, Iwaya, Ya, Sabo, Akoka, Bariga, Shomolu, Ikurudu from mile 12, where we had that flood yes. at Ajegunle. Drains into this same Lagos lagoon. Uh, McGregor Canal, Obalende, drains into this Lagos lagoon. We are draining parts of Leki, Silverbed area, uh, Mayegu, across the Atlantic into the Lagos lagoon. Yeah, so, so if you continue to shrink it, clearly you are creating a problem for us. The solutions that we have put in place are working. The places that flooded severely last year, the solutions we have put in place, some have not flooded at all this year. Some we haven't finished, but the flood is not as bad as it was the year before. And I always tell people, go to Idiaraba today. Idiaraba, long before anybody knew anything about climate change, if you rain for 30 minutes, river loot. Yes. But the solution we have put there has worked. Now, in all this 16, 18 hours rain, have you heard any complaint from the people of Idiar about, no, the place doesn't flood again? So I want to ask, um, first of all, using the Makoko residents as um, this thing, apart from the Makoko area, I mean, if you look any, across any of the major coastlines or anything, you see a lot of those shanties, even all the way on Third Mainland mm. Bridge. I mean, this has been an argument, even among a few of us, when we're talking about the Makoko place, some people say, this, they can't leave there. I'm going to say, no, where do you want them to go? You know, we've, they've had it as arguments among people. Let them go back to their villages if they cannot find house. Now, some of them believe that this is the only life they know, and they believe this is harsh, this is not, shouldn't be done, and all of that. How do you um, communicate 
as a government, with, with people like that to make them realize that they, ca they can do better? Okay. Um, I, I think it's, 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 it's relieving for me to hear that even in your informal discussions, you are not unanimous on the issue about which way to go. There is a divergence of opinion. Yes. And that can only tell you how difficult the choices we have to make are. It serves us for us uh, a very unpalatable menu of options. Yeah, because sometimes people look at it as being wicked. One is some people don't think they should be there, that they are an urban blight. Some people think that, well, so what? They have people no place to go. Help, but but I, and help. some would argue, okay, but where did they come from? Mm -hmm. And if any problem happens there, of course, they are, they are my people. They pay taxes, some of them. Some don't. And uh, even if they didn't pay, they are the part of the vulnerable poor for whom I also have responsibility. So uh, in a sense, you are between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> And, but we have engaged with them. And they speak also very clearly to part of the infrastructure deficit. Clearly, if the choices were better, they wouldn't make those choices. But it does not excuse for me leaving the rural area where at least you have a roof of food at your disposal to come and live in an urban blight. But really, it's... It's not a, because there's so many more springs yeah, up yeah. by the but day. What we're doing is that we are stemming the expansion without necessarily dislodging the old settlements because we factored all of the old settlements into place. And those are part of the blighted communities under the Lagos Metropolitan Development and Governance Project, where we are building schools, building hospitals, health centers, libraries, building markets trying to design the place into a functional community, building drainages. Even within those areas? Yes. I mean, you see, again, it depends on who is behind the camera and what he wants to see. Because in some other jurisdictions, that is a tourist asset that you will pay money to go and see, mm. properly managed. OK, well, yeah, I think I've been to Guguleto, uh -huh. which is a shanty town. Yeah, that, you will pay money. So, it, it, it depends on which lens and which eyes you look at it from. Hmm. So, and one of the things I'm looking at the Makoko end is, is what I call my own Lagos Venice. We're looking at something like that in the Ministry of Fiscal Planning. The Okubaba side of it, we're talking to them and saying, and they have agreed that they want to move. So we are developing a place for them in Agboa where they can do their logging and timber and all of that, and we're building houses for them. And they've signed with us that they're going to move. But these things take time to implement. But thankfully, the construction and the movement plans have actually left paper. They are now on site. So but it's not, it's not a world that is free of difficulty. And that is why uh, I always say that the, the skills that we bring to bear here are the skills of solving problems and maintaining a very dangerous balance, a balance that is driven by compassion on one hand, and very serious enforcement of law on the other hand. And in the Makoko case, was simply, OK, we recognize you who are here, but you will not cross one inch more. Don't expand oh, this. Oh, OK, so you actually Oh, yes. A... The people we are dealing with, we are engaged, are those who have just come. And we are saying, no way. Hmm. We won't okay. allow you to expand here. Oh, that, that is the issue. Let's take a break. Would you describe the call for the scrapping in the educational sector of the 6334 system? That is one. The second thing is that there has been massive failure. I mean, just the results have been awful over the past few years. As a government, what are you doing for the educational sector? Education, education is a measure of value. And there are prescribed rules for assessing and grading. And if any parent decided that, oh, my child would get that store of value without necessarily going through the process, process. Mm. it undermines the collective value of society. The value system becomes diminished. 
So it becomes a price that you can take without working for it. People ask me, for example, why I work so hard. I say that is the only reason why I have a moral high ground to insist that my children do their homework because they see me at work. Somebody has asked me why I've not taken a chieftaincy title. I said, but the simple reason is that I'm telling my children that it's only those people who work hard who get honored in life. So if by becoming governor I acquire all of the titles, there's going to be a disconnect in my message to my son. You say, Daddy, but you didn't do anything. You are just governor. <laughs> being governor is not enough. No, being governor is not enough. We must, have, we must have a sense of delayed gratification. gratification. Now, but back to education. Now, and those are the building blocks that we have left behind. And we must go back there. So parents must insist. How many parents go through their children's bags? I will get punished if I forgot my classmate's pencil in my bag. Yes. So, and once it didn't matter anymore, it will not matter too for any parent to go and sponsor somebody to write exams for his children. And we've seen it. Now, society moves on. Those parents are not tried and punished as a very strong statement that that kind of value system is offensive mm -hmm. to society. Then it just breeds the cancer. We just need to set examples, use some scapegoats, and you will see increasing voluntary compliance in society. Now, 6334 system, I am not sure, really. Um, I don't think that it is fair for anybody to sit down in any place and say, scrap this system. Is that what is wrong? Is it the name that we call it? Now, is it everybody who goes by the name Agatha that has been able to inspire young people? in the way that you have done. So it's really, what are we teaching them? Are we teaching them in the way that they should learn? Do we have the personnel who are able to impart the knowledge? When last did we train those personnel with modern teaching methods? And that is what I am busy doing now. I hold monthly meetings with all my public school uh, managers, the commissioner, the special advisors, all the tutors general in, in, in charge of the six districts the chairman of SUBEB, we meet every month what is going on in each district, in classrooms, what are the problems, and whatever we identify, we give people responsibility to go and solve this problem. And this is where I would depart from you slightly. I don't think that the situation is regressing. We are coming, I think, from a very poor state to states of measured progress. And yeah. yes, I can tell you that if, if you use, if you use YEC results as a measure of value. You will see, at least in Lagos, in 2007 or 8, if I remember correctly, the total overall pass was only 10, 7%. In 2008, it was 11%. In 2009, it was 18%. In 2010, we moved to 21%. We had a setback in 2011. And we've done a root and branch examination because we dropped back to about 19 or 18 percent from 21 percent in 2011. So we're expecting a better result. So what we did was, how did we what lose happened? our climb? Hmm. And what have we done? We've implemented the Eco Education Project now where there's money right in the classrooms instead of from the secretariat. The school has its budget. The teachers have their budget. The school management committee with members of the Parent Teachers Association have been involved. We're doing extra lessons for final year students in SS3, mm, preparing that's them. That, now, that's from the Lagos we, State. Lagos State. We, that's what we've been doing for mm. a year. We're doing extra lessons for them free, which parents do for their children at home. Oh, yeah. So we've done that. Uh, we've recruited younger people into the system to connect with the age difference. So we've, gotten, we've seen difficulties with maths and English. We've seen English and maths graduates who are not teachers but who know the subject? So we've taken them through crash courses for about 12 weeks in teaching methods how to manage classrooms so that they can teach it in our schools and they are younger. And we are looking to see what the results will throw up. Then one of the things we found out was that students were being promoted on the basis of 30% score from primary school right through. And then they get to the terminal exams. If they don't score 50, it's not a pass. So we've stopped that now in all our public schools now if you don't score an aggregate of 50% average 
And with 50% in math and English, you're not going to the next class. In addition to that, your parents must attend at least 90% of the parent teachers association meeting. Otherwise, you are not going to the next class. Really? So we want the schools and the parents, so the everybody, everybody must be involved. Stands. It's going to take a community to build it. But the progress that we've seen encourages us that it is possible to rebuild it again. Um, what I was talking about ICT, and that is because um, I think it was just a few days or weeks ago, you launched an ICT center. The entire world has gone ICT. But just having that one ICT center for a state like Lagos that has a population of over 18 million and all of that, what are your views on ICT? How do you intend to take Lagos State and especially youths of Lagos State towards the um, ICT era? Put them in the know. Okay, I think that's the only one that you saw, and um, that certainly is not the only one okay. in the state. Um, we're frying that's so many fish. <laughs> we're frying so many fish at different levels in the water. But that was symbolic because it was a historic building. Yes, I, I, I did see that. Uh -huh. It was a library? Yes, that used to be the old site, I think, of the old CMS Grammar School. Really? Yeah, and then it became the National Library later, and then it fell into this ruin and this use, and the whole idea was this library full of books can still serve the purpose of a paperless library yeah. that becomes contemporary and reflective of where we are today. So that was the idea behind that. It has several millions of electronic books in there now and people, and I think you can have three users to one book, so like four, four million people can be connected simultaneously. And again, that is one of the public buildings being powered by the IPP. Really? So Because you must have electricity yeah, for that to even work. We have backups and all of that, but that's where you have regular power now. So that's the story about that. And then <clears throat> uh, some of the things we put in there, uh, conferencing. And it's, it's accessible to anyone. Yeah, you just register like any library yeah. and uh, they take your data. A conferencing facility now, um, audiovisual communication and all of that in there. But that's, that's one leg of the story. All of the schools that we have built in the last four years now have ICT laboratories. Mm -hmm. Just in the way that you would have physics, chemistry, lab <coughs> lab so that students take turns with their school schedule to do it. We have an ICT village center here. Yes, I know that's that a one. Public Never thing. Fire station. Yes, that, that's, that's another one. So Is that operational? It's operational. <coughs> now, we... In, in terms of our government, the connectivity that we have in terms of government connectivity and ports, only the South African government in sub-Saharan Africa is more ICT connected than the Lagos State government. Really? Yes. Most of our operations now, budgets and all of that, land administration is all ICT driven, yes, land, our, our yes. electronic tax cards and all of that. So the connectivity we have now is only second to that of South Africa. And so, and as I told you earlier on, before we got here, I said infrastructure development, short and medium term. Yes. Tourism, yes, medium, medium term. term. ICT, long term. And that is why we've, we've, we've supported innovations like bringing fiber optic cable, like main one, glow one from Europe, because that is what you will need to drive yes. ICT. So ICT. One of the things we've also done, all of the service providers who are providing bandwidth and all of that, we've slashed our prices, because I told my team, that look, we have to be sensible now with our assets. Do we want to collect money for laying docks, or do we want to have the docks and let them connect it for, for, the use for lower for income so that all of us can have can. it? And they said, oh, this is sensible, so we reduce costs, so the state is increasingly being connected to drive the carriage of data, images, and all of that that will ultimately drive the economy of the state. Hmm. That's good. Now, let me just do a lot. Agriculture. Lagos State doesn't even have land. But you have a farmer's market, which I find very novel. Young people have been put into work, poultry farming and all that. When I spoke to you during the, was it the 1,800 days, um, interactive yeah. session we had, you talked about going to get land 
from other states mm. to put a lot more people. And you said anybody who wants to work, let them come. We will give, we will put them into work. Um, how far have you gone with that? Yes, oh, yes. I've I've sent letters to uh, Bauchi, Katsina. You're going to go that uh, far? Yeah, to Ikiti, Ogun, Oyo, and they've all responded. So I already have a farm in Oshun. I have a farmland in uh, Abuja. You do? Yeah. So, I mean, it's not that we don't have land. We are the smallest state. Yeah, for the population. Uh, just 3,577 square kilometers, the smallest in Nigeria. The largest uh, We are one quarter of the size of Ugo, which is four times our size, 16,000 kilometers. So, um, but quite apart from that small size, our land has more value for its real estate capacity rather than for it. But in spite of that, we've done our fair share of agri, we've done poultry, we've done vegetables, we're doing rice. Uh, and uh, cassava and maize farming. Do you have any plans to do to to be to do farming on such big terms that you become an exporter? Because there's oh yes, I mean the food crisis. We, we are focusing on our areas of comparative advantage, and therefore, and that's why in areas where we will require land to do other types of farming, that's why I'm going outside the state to do where you will need real massive tracts of land to to do the economies of scale. But our vegetable farming we can do in, uh, in uh, uh, greenhouses and all of that, which are very efficient, like we're doing in Ekpe, and like we're going to do in Badagri. Our rice grows very easily in Badagri and parts of Ikurudu, so it's easy to cultivate. Uh, fishing, we're doing and poultry in Ikurudu, and uh, we're expanding to other parts of the state, Ekpe and all of that. So... We, we see sustainability going forward. We already have a market, so the product is coming out. We can only ramp up. Uh, going out now, I'm going to go and pursue some export opportunities for vegetables in the next few weeks. Actually, because the world is going through the global food. Look, I don't see, I don't see why Nigeria shouldn't seize the Dubai market. Dubai is spending about $3 billion every year to import vegetables and food. Really? Carrots, potatoes for their tourists who come in. Why shouldn't we be the suppliers? This is a good one. So you're a stickler. You always talk about law and order people doing things properly. You have done that by example as well. Um, with the recent traffic law, which has just which are we expecting any more laws? Well, um, unless the existing body of laws do not respond to the responsibility that does not make it easy to discharge our responsibility. Do you, do you have a problem with people just thinking that you're too tough? Do you, do you think about that, that you just think God. Sometimes, yes, sometimes I have to explain myself that I mean no harm. I just want things to be better. Yeah, I, I do have that problem. Some people think that... Uh, does it bother you? I that take myself think that too seriously. Yes, does that, does that bother uh, but you? But for me, really, it doesn't bother me. It's just who I am and I'm, I'm almost 50, so it's too late now to learn new, to learn new tricks. New tricks. <laughs> and, and this way has worked in every society I've been. I agree. And... Um, um, I, I believe in the protective value that the umbrella of the law brings to everybody because when law and order breaks down, it's only a few people who benefit. Yes. The whole of society loses. There are things that I can do today that I know are wrong and I can only do them because I'm governor. So why should I do them? Hmm. I wish that a lot of people would think so, like that. That would be and then, So for me, is. If it's wrong today, it's going to be wrong tomorrow. So don't do it. How challenging has it been for you, sir? Well, it's been, it's been extremely interesting, the fact that uh, it's not boring. Mm. So when you go to bed, you plan your day. Can you sleep much with the, uh, the I, amount of things you well, have to do? When you go to bed, you plan your day as best you can. And of course, you can be sure like clockwork, that day will change. <laughs> So the rule is plan for the worst, hope for the best. I see. How do you unwind? I know. Unwind. Sleep. What happened to football? Well, these days now I'm hurting. Um, I'm carrying an injury that is not healing very quickly. So That's probably because you've rest still a, been playing like uh, you think yeah, you're I young. To, I have to rest a little to, to, to make it heal. But otherwise, uh, I'm going to go back to either playing snooker or playing tennis. I am shocked. Because I expected to hear the football. Yeah, yeah. Said yeah, but football now maybe it's time to slow down. 
if if the injury doesn't heal, it means that it's time, time to, to slow, slow down. down. If it heals, of course, I'll be back. Um, no. I, I still play, but but not as uh, I'm not getting to, enough it's exercise. It's time to slow down. Uh, mm -hmm. It's time to slow down. You mm -hmm. think so? Yes. What last word do you have for the Gaussians? Perhaps to put it this way, that uh, at this time of global challenges and uh, those who listen and look will see that no part of the world is free from difficulty. I see a lot of hope here. I see opportunities here. But we have to earn it. It's not just going to fall in our laps. We have to make conscious decision that this is the life that we want. And then we have to be ready to give up things, to give up our excesses, really, in order to get that life. A good life will come at a cost. It will come at the cost of restraint. It will come at the cost of peace. It will come at the cost of mutual love. And we must be ready to pay all these costs. For me, the future is very bright. Um, I think that our children stand at the cost, really, of experiencing so many of the things that were great expectations for us. And I am sure that it is possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Very grateful. Um, viewers, um, that was our guest for the week, His Excellency, Governor Babatunde Raji Fashola. Bye-bye and see you next week. Have a good day. Mm -hmm.